Hello everyone, my name is Wasim al Sindi, and today we're going to go on a, a short trip uh, to explore a new cryptocurrency research publication, uh, the Crypto Economic Systems Journal and Conference Series. So this is uh, a work that's been initiated collaboratively by the MIT Digital Currency Initiative at the Media Lab and MIT Press. And we're here uh, today at uh, CESC, Crypto Economic Security Conference 2020, uh, which uh, is part of the Unitize online event, uh, which grew out of San Francisco Blockchain Week. So very happy to be here and uh, to give you uh, a rundown on the story so far for our um, initiative. And so uh, this is uh, the outline of what I'm going to talk about today. And I always like to start by framing the problem. And in my opinion, one of the main problems we have is communication. Communication is hard uh, for humans, especially. Uh, and so let's think about how a conversation happens. Let's take a step back and think about that. So for me to have a conversation with you, I have to have neural impulses, downregulate those into small mouth noises. You hear or see those the small mouth noises or the syntax, uh, you know, the written syntax with which they correspond. And then you have to understand, try and decode that given, you know, language, grammar, context, nonverbal cues and all the rest. So this is hard at the best of times. And it's much harder when you have something uh, you know, nuanced, technical, complicated, and interdisciplinary. So this is one of my favorite memes on the screen here. And what it says is a baklava wearing a balaclava while playing balalaika on black lava. And so those words all sound different. So I'm sorry, they all sound similar, but they mean different things. But the converse can also be true, where you have words that sound very similar, but they mean different things. And also, you know, the meaning of words is contextual. Epistemology is a social endeavor. And so different fields use the same words in different ways and vice versa. So this is just kind of a preamble to the semantic wasteland that we find ourselves in, uh, even at the best of times. So here's a nice um, schematic that represents a few different things that uh, it's always uh, nice to do for framing and to unpack. And so this is a kind of network node architecture in a way. So this is, you know, cryptocurrencies are literal networks, you know, people run client software, that means that your computer becomes a node, speaks the same protocol as other computers, and then you can transact or share information and so on. So as well as being literal networks, cryptocurrency networks and, and you know, blockchain related networks are also, you know, uh, figurative, abstract networks, networks of information, networks of value, and, um, you know, ways of interconnecting uh, uh, disparate entities. Um, but what's also going on in this picture is two hands shaking and two hands shaking is the symbol of trust. Now, I know that in the COVID scene in 2020, handshaking is discouraged, but I think this uh, the symbolic importance of the handshake uh, will will live on. And so uh, cryptocurrencies are, and, sorry, and blockchain uh, uh, technologies are trust anchored networks. These are trust minimized environments where the, the blockchain and the network architecture does some of the heavy lifting so that uh, people may not need to trust an intermediary or a third party. So that's one of the very important things that I'm sure everyone's aware of, but it's always helpful to, to recap. And so cryptocurrencies are also global and borderless. And um, this means that there's often friction between the existing financial, regulatory and you know, post-Westphalian nation-state system uh, and this radically permissionless or radically borderless, um, you know, sometimes anarchic set of uh, technologies that we call cryptocurrencies. Um, and so maybe we need to uh, reimagine the kinds of institutions and the kinds of power structures that we have. And the cryptocurrencies and blockchain technology could help us do that. And so um, as well as thinking of these things as stacks of layers, you can also, as, as um, network uh, node graphs, you can also think of them as stacks of layers. And so on the left is um, a stack of layers representation of a cryptocurrency network um, that we developed after based on some work by Vitalik Buterin in 2017 in their paper called The Meaning of Decentralization. And so we just added a little bit to that, particularly the monetary layer, uh, to uh, foreground the economic characteristics of these networks. And um, what's nice about using stack of layers models like these kind of OSI-derived um, uh, concepts is that they enable us to do what you might think of as differential discretization. So we have a lot of words inside the credo of blockchain, like um, you know, blockchain itself, cryptocurrency, decentralization, permissionlessness, trust minimization, and so on, mutability, and so on. And these words can be very hard to define uh, in and of themselves, but it's quite helpful to have uh, something to hang a definition off. So, for example, I might uh, frame permissionlessness as something that occurs primarily on the um, 
social and political layer where no subset of participants in a network are prevented from using uh, that particular uh, ledger. Whereas censorship resistance might be thought of as more of a protocol layer phenomenon, not pr completely, but, but, but partially. And um, then, you know, you can then use this kind of a stack of layers framing and go kind of abstractio ad absurdum to what I've got on the right here, which is what I call an ontological meta stack. And this is, you know, the different epistemes, different kind of knowledge traditions in, in academia and intellect and how they might be related in terms of, uh, you know, the scale on this z-axis might be increasing complexity or something like that. So I'm always wondering what comes next. So things like complexity science and systems engineering appear to be quite modern kind of um, meta-epistemic um, uh, fields, which are quite syncretic and, and synthetic. They bring together a lot of different things. And so I wonder what are the meta-disciplines that, that come after this. It would be very interesting to see. So here's your friend of mine, uh, Sir Isaac Newton, uh, my former uh, high school buddy. Uh, and what he's doing in this picture is he's diffracting white light using a, a, a transparent prism into its constituent wavelengths. Um, and what we need to do with cryptoeconomic systems is actually the opposite. I'm sorry, Isaac. So what we need to do is we need to synthesize uh, the insights from technical fields such as cryptography, protocol engineering, distributed systems with the um, epistemic knowledge from economics, law, and social sciences, and even philosophy. And so this is, um, this is one of the goals that we have uh, as we build this, this journal to help mint this new field. And so let's talk about the state of things today. Let's have a progress update on uh, where we are with um, scholarly publishing, journals, and, and all the rest of it. And so I'm afraid to say things are not great in the world of scholarly publishing. And this article that was in The Guardian a little while ago, I highly recommend to get an idea of a sense of the history and progression of, of events to, to, that have led us to where we are today. And so um, I'll very briefly recap the history of scholarly publishing. Uh, the Royal Society of London is the oldest learned institution in the world, and it also um, houses the oldest journal, which is called Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society. And that was also the first peer-reviewed journal. Um, indeed, the editor, George Gabriel Stokes, at one point, was the sole reviewer as well as editor, and before this became more of a kind of um, panelised uh, committee um, uh, endeavour, broad-based endeavour. And so fast forward, and we have all these scholarly societies, like the Royal Society, so um, think about uh, American Medical Association, the Royal Society of Chemistry, and so on, and these would start journals uh, for the public good, essentially, not to make money, to cover costs. And what happened in the post-war period was that uh, some uh, enterprising public sector magnates saw an opportunity to outcompete these kind of um, uh, altruistically um, assembled scholarly publications. And uh, that's kind of how we've, and then these things consolidated, and that's how we've ended up with this, um, what you might call a publisher oligopoly, where you have this kind of half a dozen international conglomerates, uh, really with a chokehold over a great deal of uh, academic literature, to the point where um, you may be an academic and you may have public funding to do your work, and then when you publish that work in a journal, neither you nor um, members of the public that funded that work can access it. And so something seems to not be right there. And so one, this is one of the uh, many things that we're trying to address with the, with the journal. And so I'm going to go through these uh, bullet points in order and we can discuss um, some of the interesting things uh, that, um, that we've noticed. So one of the things here is on preprints and scooping. Now, this has particularly um, come to the fore in the last few months because of coronavirus, where the need for rapid publication of work prior to peer review, which can be a very slow and time consuming process, uh, necessitated um, this shift in, in importance and, and, and adding gravitas to preprints and unreviewed work. And what has also led to is an increase in retractions and um, you know, issues being found with the way that work is being done, disseminated, uh, calibrated, measured, and so on. And so this is really kind of um, the world at large, the larger world, seeing how the sausage is made with scholarly publishing and with scientific research. And you know, as with every sausage being made, it ain't as pretty as the end result. So um, I think, but I think it's important. I think it's important that people are getting wise to these things. And so one of the other things that we need to um, address in academia, one of the chief problems we have is this so-called publish or perish culture, where academics are under immense pressure to continue to publish in as high uh, uh, reputation journals as they can, but really the, the reputation is to publish, the, the incentive is to publish 
as many papers as you can in, in lots of different venues. And that will help you get promotions, tenure, prestigious appointments and the like. And so I um, mentioned peer review already. Peer review is the human verification process that's at the heart of many academic and scholarly traditions. This is essentially a paper comes into a journal. This then paper gets sent out uh, anonymized, double blinded, so that the author and the reviewer don't know who each other are. And then uh, several experts in different, you know, in the same or different fields will take a look at this paper and evaluate it based on a set of criteria as set out by the editorial board. And so um, we're going to talk a little bit about how we're doing our peer review, but there's an awful lot of discussion about whether peer review is necessary at all. And so that's an interesting topic to discuss. Um, one of the other things that's very interesting, I'll get to later, is publishing economics. And this is something that um, is really coming to the fore now that this um, movement of open science and open access is gaining steam. And the final thing to talk about is uh, author's rights. And so, you know, very often these traditional publishers will take copyright. They will take control over um, the literary output of, of academics. And um, this is something that can lead to some perverse incentives that we're trying to avoid. So we're trying to be minimally invasive with um, how we accept uh, the, the, the conditions that we impose on published papers. So those are the, the, the things that we're trying to address, uh, particularly with crypto economic systems. And so let's talk about the story so far. And the story should always start with why. Why should we create a new journal? At present, there's no neutral, interdisciplinary, open access and high quality peer reviewed cryptocurrency publication venue. And that's because this is a new field. You know, Nakamoto's paper only came out well, less than 12, 12 years ago. So in the, um, s s in the uh, academic timescale, this geological timescale of, of the university, this is actually just a blink of an eye. This is, um, you know, a couple of postdocs or a few PhD students. So, um, you know, we are still at very much at the beginning of, of, of all of this. And um, one of the things that uh, falls upon us is to create some of the infrastructure to help the field mature and uh, develop. And so one of the things that's very important to say is that, you know, we're building between the MIT Digital Currency Initiative and the MIT Press, we're building essential non-profit research infrastructure uh, for the Crypto Economic Systems Journal and Conference Series. And so I want to take a slight diversion to give some of the kind of uh, theoretical uh, background to how a journal might work inside a, a knowledge ecosystem, such as a, you know, a field or a set of fields. And so this comes from some work by uh, two of our program committee members, Jason Potts and Eleanor Rennie. And um, they wrote a paper several years ago called A Journal is a Club. And so this is based on the economics of club theory, uh, where we apply the idea of a journal as a knowledge club, which is jointly producing a shared resource or a local public good. That's, you know, the, the, the peer reviewed research, the, the verified outputs. And uh, what's happening, you know, the part of the process of this is that there's a you know, group formation. So there's kind of a community forming. And that's something that we're very much you know, um, keen to, to help foster and develop. There's a series of rules. You know, the journal has various um, um, specifications, requirements, and so on, and expected benefits. Now, in this case, these benefits are non-financial because it's a scholarly endeavor. So the primary advantage is prestige, and the prestige is conferred by the exclusivity of the you know, opportunity to publish in the journal. And so one of the other, some of the other characteristics of, um, of uh, a club are that participation is voluntary, it's non-anonymously crowded, so you kind of know who's around. It's exclusive, so not everybody can, can get in. It's globally partitioned and it's rationally constructed. And so those are just some of the kind of bits of background to, to how a club might work. Now, what's a bit different about a journal is that the papers that come out of the peer review process that are accepted are both the current outputs of the process and they may also be the future inputs of the process into like you know, subsequent papers and, and, and research and so on. One other interesting thing to say is that um, producers and consumers in this case are not distinct sets. So the people writing the papers overlap quite heavily with the people that are reading the papers. Um, you know, this is you know, a relatively small field. So I think that uh, at present anyway, so I think that the overlap is probably quite tight at the moment. Um, but the real kind of nub, nubbin of this, the real point that we need to get to is that the shared good here is mutual attention to an idea. You know, the ideas in the papers and the kind of epistemic formation around crypto economic systems that we're trying to help foster here. And there's a little table here which people use to kind of map out where, where club goods uh, live in the, in the sphere of, of different kinds of production. And so depending on the amount of rivalry and the excludability, you have either private goods, club goods, common resources and public goods. 
And so club goods are in this situation where there's low rivalry, but high excludability. Okay, moving on. Now a little bit of the human background. And so uh, Crypto Economic Systems is a, a human endeavour. We have uh, quite a large team of people working behind the scenes to, to make all of this happen. And so we have three editors, uh, Nehar Narula, who's the director of the MIT Digital Currency Initiative, Andrew Miller, who's an assistant professor of computer science at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, and myself, Wasim al Sindi, also working with MIT Digital Currency Initiative. And we have a, a very imminent, eminent board of advisors uh, to help us to uh, um, and navigate our way through this uh, this novel territory. And they range from um, uh, noted economists at Chicago Booth to um, inventors of cryptographic constructions, uh, Turing Medal winners, principal researchers at big techs, and uh, you know, former regulators and uh, experts in the Bitcoin and Ethereum code bases. So it's really quite a range, and, and we're trying to help to synthesize and create links between academia and practice here. Okay, now let's talk about the crypto economic system story so far. And so um, we kicked off in earnest with an uh, invited summit in October of last year at the MIT Media Lab with approximately 250 attendees and 60 talks, workshops and panels, really trying to kind of collectively um, brainstorm the open challenges and unsolved questions and the roadblocks and barriers to the maturation of, of this, this um a nexus of, of, of disciplines as a new field. We then um, engaged on our, uh, uh, our first peer review season over the winter, received 80 papers uh, submitted um, and sent a subset of those to our 42 member peer review program committee across uh, disciplines. And from those, we selected 26 papers for our first flagship conference, Crypto Economic Systems 2020. And that took place at the MIT Media Lab uh, sorry, at uh, MIT in early March, just before everything shut down for Corona. So this was you know, one of the last conferences before uh, the world really changed. So we're happy that we, we managed to, to, to um, uh, squeeze it in in time, but we were also uh, very mindful of any potential public health uh, implications. And we're very happy that um, very few of those seem to have arisen. So I just want to give you a very brief whistle-stop tour of the kinds of ranges of papers that we, we accepted and that were in the Crypto Economic Systems 20 programme. So we had papers on uh, political economy, uh, ethics and ethical surveys, uh, the impossibility of, um, of resolving the existing financial system with uh, you know, automated and smart contract oriented ones, and taking systems engineering and complex science, complexity science perspectives to crypto economic systems. And so um, we are in the advanced stages of preparing our um, first issue, the prototypical issue zero of the journal. And I just want to show you a preview of how that is looking on our platform, which is called PubPub, which is a, a beautiful uh, digital substrate for, for publishing all kinds of things. It's very experimental and, and forward thinking. And that is uh, arising out of a collaboration between um, MIT Press and MIT Media Lab as the Knowledge Futures Group. So they do some great work over there, particularly with PubPub and Underlay. So um, I want to now shift gears and we'll talk about some of the um, you know, structural um, issues and things that we've encountered and that we're trying to, to address. So one of the challenges with interdisciplinarity and also multidisciplinarity, transdisciplinarity, transversality, is that um, the existing structures, particularly in academia, may not reward them in the same way that, that um, status quo research is, is is rewarded. And so I like to think of universities, each department or faculty in university, as a little tower, a little ivory tower of its own. And the incentives for, for staff members are to climb the little ladder in that ivory tower. And that's how you get your professorship or your, you know, you join the deanery or, or whatever, whatever it is you're looking for. And so the incentives are a little bit asymmetric. So it's more incentive aligned for people to stay in their lane, so to speak, than to kind of uh, be transverse. Although that, that's probably changing. The other thing to say is that there's a lack of harmony in the, in the publishing traditions between fields. And so, uh, for example, in a law, law reviews are tend to be run by students. In economics, we have, if, you want to, if you're particularly in the American system and you're looking for tenure, you are trying to publish in one of half a dozen monolithic journals that has existed for 50 or 100 years. And in computer science, reflecting the speed at which the field moves, um, uh, work tends to be um, foregrounded at conferences first and then um, uh, published his proceedings after the fact. And so we have all of these different kind of incompatibilities. 
And there's another uh, concept which is uh, outlined in the abstract on the on the slide there, which I I'm, I think is very Im interesting to explore, um, which is for, from a, a philosopher called Nathan Ballantyne at Ford, Ford University, and that's epistemic trespassing. So this is the idea that uh, you know we live in this age of interdisciplinarity now. So we're all epistemic trespassers. We're all judging fields and matters outside of our expertise. And that's fine as long as we acknowledge that. But there is a tension there between epistemic trespassing and ex expert culture, which uh, obviously universities are particularly um, ingrained in. So that tension remains to be seen how that tension will be resolved. I hope that a new generation of interdisciplinary thinkers and researchers will, will emerge. And um, I see myself in, in, in that mould as well. So one of the interesting things that we've noticed is that um, this idea of antidisciplinarity this idea of, you know, imagine the network node map I showed you earlier. Each of the nodes, each of the points, is an episteme, like mathematics or chemistry or computer science or economics. And then the edges, they represent interdisciplinary, interdiscipl interdisciplinary approaches. Multidisciplinary approaches are superpositions of multiple nodes. And antidisciplinary approaches are in the voids. So you're kind of looking where people don't go. Um, but what we find is there's a varying amount of tolerance for antidisciplinarity uh, in different fields. And so this is something that's very hard to, to harmonise. But again, I hope that the, um, you know, as culture develops and time goes on, this thing will get easier. And there's also a question mark about funding. So funding, uh, especially in universities, tends to be determined by uh, committees on, on grant giving bodies. And that is influenced by things like government policy. Um, and so it may be that those are um, leaning traditional, leaning conservative, and it makes it harder to fund more adventurous and interdisciplinary research. Okay, I want to talk now a little bit more about peer review. And so publishing cultures vary across fields, as we said earlier, and interdisciplinary service may not be uh, as recognised you know, in, in accordance with the previous um, slide's findings. We also find that practice and theory, ac academia and practice, have very different interactions across fields as well. And uh, what we're trying to do is find ways that we can um, mitigate this tragedy of the common situation with peer review. Can we incentivize peer review? Can we help people um, make it a priority? You know, everyone's very busy, especially experts in academia and industry, and it's uh, very hard for them to give up a lot of their time to, to engage in this laborious uh, uh, peer review verification process. And so we're trying to find ways that we can um, incentivize or, and, uh, you know, respect their attention and their time. But at the same time, we're trying to find ways that we can improve the peer review process, speed it up, make it more transparent and make it function better. And so we're also looking at ways we can expedite peer review. Um, and so, yes, we're very open to ideas on, on all of those things. So happy to hear any thoughts you might have. One of the other things we're looking at and uh, what we've, uh, we've uh, employed so far is an is a open a variant of open peer review where we want to publish an output from the review process. So what happens normally is uh, papers will get sent to a conference or a journal, they will get reviewed, and then the reviews will get sent to the authors at the time of the outcome, and then that's pretty much it. The reviews basically go in the bin. And so this seems like a very um, inefficient way of, um, of re respecting uh, the scarce re reviewer attention, which is a valuable resource. And so um, we want to also encourage transparency. So we want to use uh, this, the, these review outputs as a way of, of, of seeding debate in the community. And I think that's very important for us to, uh, as a field, as an industry, a nascent industry, to build legitimacy. We also like to encourage debate, which I think um, is, is already, um, we've already been succeeding at that as a result of the conferences and the review phases. And we also, you know, we want to set higher standards. We always want things to, to be better and stronger and more legitimate and more credible. And so here's an interesting idea that we've been exploring, which I'd be very interested to hear anyone's ideas on, suggestions. And this idea of peer-to-peer -peer review, or mercenary peer review, as some people call it. The idea being that we can go back in time, look at any paper, any time period, any discipline. We can uh, uh, take perspectives from different fields. We can uh, look at papers in, in a new context, in a new light after time has passed. And we can maybe pick out uh, errors or inconsistencies or shortcomings in those um, you know, for, for, for additional clarity for, for the research, uh, the corpus of research going forwards. So happy to hear any suggestions on that. And I just wanted to show you a little bit of how the sausage is made, because I think this is very interesting for, for um, even academics that engage as reviewers, they may not be seeing these kinds of statistics. So uh, this is some of the results that came out of our first peer review phase. On the uh, left, you have 
um, reviewer average scores, and on the right you have paper average scores. And what we noticed is that, um, so the way that review process works is papers come in from the call for papers, we assign them to reviewers, then the reviewers write their reviews based on criteria that we give, and they give them a score, a quality score between one and five, where one is a reject, two is a weak reject, three is a weak accept, four is an accept, and five is a strong accept. So this is like, you know, from one to five, how strongly, uh, how um, uh, the reviewer views the quality of the paper. But what we found was that there was a, a heterogeneity and anisotropy between um, the scores that people from more technical backgrounds would give and people from other backgrounds might give. And we call this, you know, loosely disciplinary bias. And so uh, we're trying to find ways that we can overcome that and, and calibrate for that. And so we did some kind of statistical analysis and we used that as a sanity check to make sure that any uh, borderline papers and public uh, borderline papers and submissions uh, were given a, a fair um, a fair go if their reviews tended to be on the harsh side, for example. So I want to say something about the interaction of academia and practice here. Um, you know, cryptocurrencies did not come from the academy. The, you know, the Nakamoto white paper got dropped on a PDF server in 2008. And much of the work that predated it came from practice rather than academia. And so in many ways, academia is playing catch up here. And part of the reason for that is uh, in academia, the incentives in the culture are to be very thorough and slow moving, whereas in industry, uh, the incentives are aligned to move fast and hopefully not break things. So, um, and I don't think I need to tell anyone um, right now in the COVID scene, when all, every campus, every university campus is closed, that there are increasing structural, economic and ontological problems at universities. Like, you know, what is the point of a university in today's age? And uh, maybe publishing uh, can be one of those things that, you know, helps to build a, build, build a bridge between uh, uh, academics and industrial experts and helps to give the university a, a new place in, in the 21st century. Uh, one un interesting trend, uh, you know, and the converse to that is that big techs such as Microsoft, Amazon and Google are starting to snap up very high quality researchers that might otherwise be, um, you know, professors or, or senior researchers. And there seems to be an increasing uh, compatibility of the kind of research track career uh, that is, you know, maybe even rivaling or surpassing the quality of the career that you might have in academia there. And so, and also, just lastly to say that things like reviewing papers, we call them scholarly service, and there may be different appreciations of that outside academia. So, for example, if you work at a company that doesn't really um, engage in the process of, of, um, of uh, scholarly publishing and knowledge production, um, then the management may not appreciate uh, the amount of time and effort that's required to keep this kind of peer review uh, endeavor going forwards. So I just wanted to show you something that takes a step back and give you some historical context, some light-hearted historical context about academic service. So academics and, and so scholarly service. So academics and industrialists are very busy people. There's many pressures on their time and um, asking them to do service may mean that they have to take their eyes off something else. But this is an ongoing problem. So this is a tweet going over some historical issues that were etched into a cuneiform tablet 2,700 years ago by a group of Middle Eastern astronomers who were complaining that um, their time was being split between administrative duties and research duties. So this is an ongoing problem. And so I just want to say, you know, wrap up by saying something very quick about open access, which is close to the idea of, of open source and um, the idea of the publishing economics around that. So article processing charges, where um, journals charge the authors for submitting, are, are pretty bad. They, they lead to all kinds of perverse incentives for the journal, where uh, people are setting up now kind of scam journals, predatory journals. And as a result, open access has a bit of a bad rep around academics at the moment. And so this is a vicious circle that um, it falls upon many of us to try and uh, to break out of by producing good quality open access uh, publications. And there's a very big problem with the economics of open access, uh, where um, uh, you pay a fee at the start, regardless of whether that uh, paper is rejected in 15 seconds or accepted. And so there are all kinds of problems and suggestions for how to unbundle that. And so I just want to leave, the, uh, leave you with uh, the final questions about whether we should set up a preprint server, how we can manage concurrent submissions, so papers can go to more than one uh, venue, how to do conflicts of interest, uh, managing submission management platforms. We're looking for event hosts, which obviously is a bit difficult at the moment, but I'll mention it anyway. And we're also bootstrapping through a fundraising and ecosystem uh, 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 funding drive. And so I want to thank you for your attention and draw your attention to Journal Issues Europe, which comes out soon, and the call for papers for Crypto Economic Systems 21, which will be announced shortly. And so my name is Wasim, and you can reach me at editor at crypto Thank you very much for your time.